the last section here, we're going to talk about emotion. So we'll start off with a nice definition here. The uh, emotion is defined as this kind of short-lived psychological state that activates some kind of neural system. So there has to be some kind of biological grounding, we think, to emotion. It can't be just any kind of arbitrary cognitive state. Um, you know, has a qualia, has some kind of subjective feeling, whatever. We can't really define that objectively, obviously. And it's kind of this whole cluster of psychological, cognitive, behavioral, and biological changes. And so this idea that there's something real about emotion, we'll see, is like one of the enduring, uh, really important aspects of it, that reality of emotion you know, it's, it's, it's the thing that, you know, in movies, uh, the AI is always like, doesn't feel emotion and, and the human feels emotion. And so that, that makes us real. Um, it's interesting if you think about it kind of, you know, from a slightly more logical kind of perspective, um, the things that make it real are actually really kind of evolutionarily ancient grounded amygdala, brainstem, hypothalamus, you know, these really low level parts of our brains. And yet these are the things we hold up as being kind of the most human defining things. And so uh, there's an interesting kind of set of issues there around what, what, what do we really think about emotion? In some ways, emotion should be considered to be kind of, you know, taking us back to our animal past and not like heralded as like this amazing defining characteristic of people. On the other hand, it's something we all share. That's because it's kind of biologically grounded. We all have these emotions that we can share. And sort of almost by definition, emotional states are the most important states of our existence. You know, they color our experience in powerful ways. Uh, that ability to feel and to reflect on those feelings and especially that reflection capability and the ability to have more of a kind of combination of conscious awareness and emotion, that combination of the consciousness, which may be more, you know, specifically human, that verbal level, that, that metacognitive level, um, and being able to kind of reflect upon and be aware of the emotional experiences that are bubbling up from those brainstem systems. You know, that's more perhaps what's what what's trying to be captured there is that that unique ability to be aware of those low level things that are happening in our brains. And I think because they are low level there, you know, this is essentially what Freud tapped into um, this sort of great subconscious underworld under there, all these kind of crazy things that are bubbling up from our brain stems and because we're not consciously aware of everything that happens in our subcortical systems you know it does have that mystery if you're you know thinking about it from the perspective of your conscious awareness and your cortex all that stuff just kind of comes out of nowhere um, and yet it's very powerful and it makes us feel these amazing things and so um, i think you know those are the kind of things that really uh capture the importance uh and and uh you know enduring interest in uh, emotion. We think of emotion technically in the psychology world as, you know, it's kind of more short-lived, transitory kind of state. And then mood is, in contrast, a longer lasting uh, feeling. Um, it's not triggered by a specific event. Um, and so, you know, it kind of is ongoing. So like you're in a depressed mood for several days. Um, that is an enduring state. It might have been triggered by something originally, uh, that, you know, not triggered part is kind of, you know, debatable, but uh, it's at least not transitorily triggered. And then affect is another term that I tend to think of as sort of, you know, another way of talking about emotion. Uh, technically speaking, it's sort of this uh, map of understanding uh, how we categorize different emotions. So uh, in terms of valence, we'll talk about, uh, which is good versus bad, and then arousal. Uh, in terms of, you know, how strong is the emotion. So here's that circumplex of, uh, circumplex just means some kind of organizing things around on a circle. Um, on the bottom top dimension, um, you have the, the kind of intensity uh, or arousal dimension. So you have these kind of low levels of activation down here at the bottom and very high levels of activation up at the top. 
And then on the left right axis, the horizontal axis, you have the, the kind of valence, negative emotion versus positive emotion, right? So extreme elation on the high positive, extreme uh, upset or distress on the, on the negative axis, et cetera. And certainly there's something common physiologically about arousal in both high elation kind of cases and high anger kind of cases. You have an increase in heart rate, you have that, that sympathetic nervous system ramping up uh, those kinds of things. Um, and so similarly, uh, you have similarities on the low activation state in terms of low levels of that arousal. So there is that sense in which arousal is this physiological variable that we can measure independent of the kind of content of the uh, state, uh, whether or not we're actually feeling kind of something positive or negative. There is a list that, that has been established of kind of basic emotions. So you have fear, anger, sadness, happiness, disgust, contempt, and then surprise or interest. And so one question is like, why, why are there, you know, these sets of things? What about love and hate, uh, pain, hunger, lust? You know, what about all these other things that we might put in as sort of basic emotions? And that's kind of very debatable uh, what, what's considered basic or not. We'll see that the, one of the main definitions is just trying to establish things as being consistent across all cultures. So sort of the sense in which it's biologically based, we see it in other animals um, so that we can kind of establish that as something that, that is not just a, a kind of cultural uh, high level state, but really something again, that's grounded in the brain. And it's pretty interesting that uh, happiness is kind of the only positive one. Here are these facial expressions. Um, so maybe you can kind of see, this is, uh, I think, anger, disgust, fear, happiness, contempt, and surprise. <laughs> okay. And surprise is kind of ambiguously positive, right? So it's Sometimes it can be negative uh, uh, surprise versus positive surprise. So these six kind of core emotions have been identified mainly on the basis of these kind of facial expressions and the fact that we communicate these emotions with our faces um, and that these are kind of universally recognized across cultures clearly indicates the kind of central importance of those. Um, there's also a a disagreement face, <laughs> this maybe not kind of thing. Uh, that's a different uh, facial expression that seems to operate across different cultures as well. So maybe there's a seventh uh, category. Um, but the, the really important point here is that emotion in part is also something that has a social dimension to it. It's something we communicate to others. And, and so uh, it's very important for us to share our emotional states with others so that they know how to interact with us. So we can say, look, I'm feeling sad, so you better not talk about things that are gonna make me even more sad or I'm gonna be maybe violating some social conventions because I'm not feeling well. Um, and you know, obviously communicating fear is very important. If I'm afraid, you should probably be afraid. So that, that kind of feeling of, uh, of sharing and communicating in that way. And so a lot of these, uh, uh, emotional differentiations may have a lot to do with kind of communicating different situations socially. And interestingly, there are different kind of cultural conventions about, you know, when is it okay to express different kinds of emotions? Uh, and so, you know, in some cultures, you know, these very kind of exuberant displays of emotion are sort of accepted. Um, in other cultures, that would be very kind of unusual and frowned upon to be so exuberant. Um, and so there's definitely different kind of ways in which these things are scaled, but nevertheless, there are these kind of universal expressions of different emotions. You can think about the motivational factors uh, that uh, these emotions kind of under, underpin. So, uh, so basically, you know, an emotion is sort of like a drive state that gives rise to a corresponding kind of motivation to do something, right? So fear your motivational consequence of that is to avoid negative outcomes, right? So if you're expressing that emotional emotion of fear, you wanna avoid that impending bad situation that you're afraid of, right? Anger uh, is more, again, that kind of approach dimension towards fear. Instead of having an avoidance relationship towards some negative outcome, you have a kind of control 
and attack and approach uh, relationship to the negative outcome and try to attack it. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, obviously disgust is an avoidance thing. That's not something that you directly fear as kind of a threat per se, but it's something that you disapprove of uh, or that is kind of bad in, in some other way and should be avoided, right? And so it, it goes to like, you know, the basic level of food, disgusting food, but also disgusting behavior, you know, things that we think are not appropriate. Um, and there's really that, that kind of tapping into of that core disgust emotion, emotion um, that really plays into a lot of these in-group, out-group dynamics. And then uh, contempt is also obviously very much a social force, uh, social motivational thing to kind of like punish bad people. So if somebody's uh, breaking the rules of your culture and your society, um, you, you hold them in contempt. You say, this is just not appropriate. And so, yeah, so there's really a clear sense in which each of the emotional states acts again like this kind of drive to, to, to drive you to do uh, certain kinds of actions to address that kind of emotional state. Happiness on the positive side drives you to approach and, and open up and, and seek out uh, those kinds of positive states. And then, you know, surprise and interest. Again, if it's a more positive sense of surprise in the interest sense, um, you want to approach those as well to learn about them. So curiosity and that kind of stuff. So one thing that you might think about is like, well, what is the point of sadness? What is the motivational uh, consequence of sadness? What does that actually do? In some ways, that's the kind of the negation of these kind of positive approach-like behaviors. And it's sort of a withdrawal, right? It's a sort of disengagement in the social environment. It's actually associated with kind of subordination. And so, you know, if you uh, have tried to uh, do something positive in some group and, and you get rejected, you feel that kind of, you know, withdrawal and sadness from that group. Um, and so it has that same kind of social dynamic of being sort of, you know, not accepted by the group, finding your particular place in, in, in some organization or group. Um, is part of that sadness thing. And as well, also dealing with, you know, feelings of loss of control. And as we uh, have said many times that depression is really much more about control and loss of self-efficacy. And so sadness is kind of a way of expressing this feeling of lack of self-efficacy and also, you know, a social communication that you're feeling that and therefore an opportunity for other people to help and, and, provide more social support to overcome those uh, internal states. So, so there's, there's, it's a signal to others to help. There is a kind of motivational and social function really for all of these different emotional states.